Hello and welcome to Africa This Week with me, Anissa Omar. This show looks at the affairs of sub-Saharan Africa and the African diaspora. Today we'll be discussing comments from Senegal's President Macky Sall and his clampdown on Muslim clerics associated with fringe groups. Our dosage of articles on the diaspora, which caught our eye this week, is also coming up. In light of Remembrance Day honouring soldiers in World War I, we look at how Africans and the Commonwealth contributed. But first, campaigning kicked off on Sunday in Burkina Faso, Day, Burkina Faso, head of crucial November 29th national vote, which interim leader Michael Cofando said will be key to consolidating democracy weeks after a failed coup hit the West African country. Adam Manunu has more on this and the rest of the week's headline news. The attempted overthrow was derailed within days by popular uprising. Much of street protests toppled former strongman Blas Compiore at the end of October 2014. Rochmark Christian Cabore, one of the favourites in Burkina Faso's presidential vote on the 29th of November, launched his campaign. Notre mandat portera le sceau de l'intégrité. Et nous avons dit, l'intégrité a des exigences. C'est des exigences d'abord du travail bien fait. C'est des exigences d'amour pour sa patrie. C'est des exigences de bonne gouvernance. In the most controversial decision ahead of the vote, the interim authorities have ruled that nobody who backed Compiore's bid to keep power can stand for elected office. The chief executive of South Africa-based mobile phone operator, MTN, resigned on Monday over a $5.2 billion fine imposed on the company in Nigeria. Sefiso Debangwa, former CEO of Africa's largest telecoms firm, resigned as Nigeria's Communications Commission penalized the company for missing a deadline to deactivate 5.1 million unregistered SIM cards. Diana Games, the executive director of the South African Nigeria Chamber of Commerce, said the government appeared to be acting for financial and security reasons, citing that Boko Haram could be using unregistered SIM cards to plot more attacks. Angola marked 40 years of independence on Wednesday, with President José Eduardo dos Santos vowing to bring progress to the country, but rights groups accused him of ruling through what they called fear and repression. Dos Santos, who has been in power since four years after independence from Portugal, opened a huge new parliament in the capital Luanda to celebrate the anniversary. In a speech inaugurating the building, he vowed to respect human rights and basic freedoms in Angola. Angola was engulfed in a 27-year civil war after independence, with a ceasefire finally signed in 2002. European Union and African leaders on Thursday approved a 1.8 billion euro action plan they hope will stem explosive flows of migrants across the Mediterranean. The plan, which immediately came under fire from Senegal President Macky Sall, includes provisions on speeding up the repatriation of failed asylum seekers, as well as a limited expansion of opportunities for legal migration. An emergency trust fund of 1.8 billion euros will finance development projects and address causes of pressures caused by migration, including repressive governance, poverty and conflict. The joint plan was approved at the end of a two-day summit in Malta this week, despite misgivings among some African governments over what they see as a trend towards a fortress Europe. The UN Security Council unanimously adopted a resolution on Thursday that could pave the way for peacekeepers to be deployed to Burundi. The French drafted measure strongly condemned the wave of killings, torture, arrests and other rights violations. This follows a UN human rights official who said on Tuesday that the UN is less equipped to deal with the crisis than it was in dealing with Rwanda before the 1994 genocide. Last weekend, a UN employee was among those killed in Burundi in an armed attack on a bar by gunmen dressed in police uniforms. Senegal's President Macky Sall has called for a fight against what he describes as the excessive form of Islam, which has led to the growth of radical groups. Last week, Senegalese officials said two imams had been charged with money laundering and suspected links with Muslim militia. 
it is the first such case in Senegal, a mainly Muslim country, less known for violence linked to radical groups. Other West African states, including Nigeria and Mali, are battling militia linked to Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State group. Speaking at a peace and security conference in the capital, Dakar, on Monday, Mr. Saul said people should have the courage to fight this excessive form of Islam and that such groups should not be allowed to impose another form of religion, which he said did not correspond to the practice of Muslims in the country as a whole. Joining me to discuss the last story is Al Haji Joe, a journalist observing Gambian and Senegalese affairs. Thank you for joining us, Al Haji. So, to start the discussion, what is this Torah Islam that President Macky is speaking of? Well, President Macky Sall appeared uh, on an international forum in Dakar on Monday on peace and security, mm -hmm. where he denounced what he called the extremists trying to enter Senegal like they do in Chad, Nigeria, Cameroon and other places. This came following the arrest of an imam in a village called Kaulak, just two kilometers away from Dakar, for being preaching about extremism and supporting terrorism. The imam called Alindau was arrested alongside six other supporters who are currently detained at the state central prison in Dakar. So what is it exactly that Mackie is saying? He's saying that he wants to try and maintain and enclose this fringe ideology? Yes. President Sal totally denounced the new Islamic ideology that this, some of these Islamic scholars are trying to nurture on people. He said Islam is a religion of peace mm -hmm. and has ever had its own principles and it will ever remain the same. And no how does he aim to do that? Well, the comments came following the arrest of the Imam. Mm -hmm. Now he's denouncing the appearance of certain people or Muslim women wearing their bills in a way that is totally unacceptable in Islam. According to him, the overall, the wearing of the bill over in, in an overall form is totally not in accordance with Islam. And according to President Sal as well, it's the same way the suicide bombers and other extremists wear and do the suicidal in places like the Zayat, Chad and other places. Especially the Boko Haram, he cited them as the best example in a neighboring country. Okay, so you're saying it's not in accordance with Islam. I understand that Islam has been in Senegal since the 11th century and that it's very much entrenched. Would you say that this new sort of fringe ideology is really pushing this tradition aside and bringing a new, a new, a new frontier? In this, Islam is the, is the dominating religion in Senegal. With one can say 95%, 97% of the population. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they have the right to do anything they feel like. Probably the country is dominated, yes, indeed. Everybody knows the country is dominated by Muslims. Mm -hmm. But the comments of President Makisal was denounced by Muslim scholars all over the country. Okay, so co comments, but he's saying that he wants to reform the clerics and try and train them in a way that is the usual, traditional uh, form of Islam that Senegal presents. So how, how is he going to realistically train clerics? Well, he has instructed the Ministry of Interior to work with the Supreme Islamic Council in Senegal. Okay. To meet with, to meet with the Imam and discuss this issue properly mm -hmm. before he takes any action against them. He wants, a, he wants a, a, a decision that will be made among them, the imam and the, and the authorities from the government, before any other government step. If they fail to meet any agreement, according to him, he will take his own step and wipe them out of Syria. But they will never practice another religion different from Islam. Okay, so 
That, that, that's a way of getting to the clerics. But do you think it's just about clerics? Do you think perhaps there's a wider picture in terms of media and other influences that could be bringing this fringe ideology on board? Yeah, that's, 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 that's media, two media, very, very, very important lessons from the from the media. Well, just last night, uh, uh, a very prominent guy uh, and a professor of one of the biggest uh, media media organization called World Fighting was on TV mm -hmm. and denounced the comments made by President and the actions he wants to take against against Muslims, especially women, wearing the veil in that manner. According to him, the president is, is he called him anti Islam. Mm -hmm. He totally condemned the president's action, saying since he came to power, he has never supported anything in support of Islam. He mentioned the, the protest march, the president went to Paris during the start of the Hebdo attack against the when they caricatured the prophet, the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which he said the president should have it there and he went there and and, he and was protesting on the streets. Again, he's back and now saying women should not wear an overall veil because they can be suicidal. We have to take examples from other countries, this and that. So he totally condemned the president. And not only him, many of the other Muslim scholars as well condemned the president. So this is the, the reaction. To take. Is this the sorry? So is this the reaction from from Muslim clerics? They're, they're not happy with these comments. Do you think these co this yeah, comment coming from a president is is unusual or it's necessary? Uh, it's, a, it's unusual indeed, but though it's, though it's very necessary, yeah, but very unusual in a Muslim-dominated country like Senegal. And do you think many that... are saying that many are saying mm -hmm. you have you have uh, instituted a, a a team or a panel of, of advisors on this, on, on 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 religion who have advised him prior to making certain comments because. Senegal is a Muslim dominated country and you cannot change the minds of the people. Okay, Al Haji, very, very interesting comments from a, as you say, very interesting comments coming from Senegal. Now we'll be looking at our articles this week, what that caught our eye. Joining me, we have Lagoon Akloy, who is a political commentator on West African affairs and works as a public relations officer for Central Association of Nigerians in the UK. Welcome to the show, Lagoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've mm. got some articles for the week. We do, some very interesting ones. What, what's our first one? The first one has to do with the um, swearing in of the 36 ministers um, by the President Buhari of mm -hmm. Nigeria. Um, he became president in April of this year. And where's mm. this article from? This article is from the, the Abuja magazine. Yeah. Abuja yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Buhari came in on a crest of hope. Um, Nigerians yearned for change. Mm -hmm. um, he defeated the, the incumbent, Gl 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 Jonathan, which was the first time this actually happened um, in, um, in Nigeria. The PDP, who good luck was the president of, uh, had been in power for 16 years since Nigeria gained, um, gained um, independence. So um, who are these ministers mm. that he's brought in? I heard that there was a, a former UK a, a accountant. Yep, yep, is she going to resolve the economic crisis of The Minister uh, of Finance, uh, Kemi Adeoshun, yep. she actually is one of the guiding lights in the new administration um, for the sure reason that she's a UK-trained um, economist, okay. um, the former commissioner of Ogun State in mm. uh, southwest Nigeria, and is somebody who Buhari thinks can really change things up and put N N Nigeria's... Uh, uh, is, she, is she the only one? I heard that there's an oil minister that's come in, but, but didn't Buhari Buhari say that he was going to deal with oil himself. Um, Buhari has given himself the oil portfolio. What he's done is he's created a minister of state, um, okay. Ibe Kawachuku, who will be the, his deputy oil minister. Interesting. So what's our second article? Um, second article is the um, 40 years um, since Angola got independence. Um, Angola um, fought a long, drawn-out war with Portugal, which ended in 1975, mm -hmm. um, to get the independence. And where's this article from? The article from is written by a guy called um, Rafael Dua Mores. Um, and I think it's from the, in, the Angolan uh, Times. Okay, so yeah. Um, and um, it basically details how um, Angola, at this current point, though they've been independent for the past 40 years, mm -hmm. um, in the country themselves, they've encountered problems. Uh, freedom of speech is not entirely there. <coughs> and people are, uh, people are complaining about human rights violations. And people are even going as far as to say that um, he's formed a corrupt clique around him. Um, they, bring, they mention in the article um, his daughter, Isabel de Santos, mm -hmm. um, who is the richest uh, woman in Africa. Um, she's worth $3 billion. Um, they say that um, how can she be worth that much money? Um, where's money coming from? They also reference the partnership between um, Portugal and Angola. Angola, over the past uh, five to ten years, has been investing heavily um, in Portugal. 
Um, so mm. Portugal is the former a colonial yeah, power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, is the there, tables have turned in certain ways. Yes, because mm. I know I, I've seen this article also in in the Guardian. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite it's well it's it's well it's well uh, well spread. Mm -hmm. In terms mm -hmm. of it being a colonial state, mm -hmm. do you think that this new state is just another colonial state that is um, replicated? I wouldn't say it's a new colonial state. I would say they're asking for what has changed since the colonial days. Um, they're complaining that um, they kicked out the Portuguese only to be replaced by a regime that is even as brutal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, I think Angola has been going through some, 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 some progress. Mm -hmm. um, the oil revenue has been rising. But the question is, the money's not being distributed back into the people. So that's where everyone's been Where's getting Where's the money going? I thought I, th I heard it's mm -hmm. going elsewhere. I think it might be going yeah, back um, to the colonial... Uh, I, I think that um, the government in Angola has been investing in Portuguese uh, banks and industries and, wow. and, and like real estate and, yes. you know... Um, the, the, the money is being sent abroad, but, uh, but, but at the same time, you know... Um, so it's still the colonial structures? The colonial structures are still quite strong. In With terms, resources, I mean, effectively, it, um, In terms of, of, of the partnership, yes. Going yeah. out. Yeah. So what's yeah. our third story, Lagoon? Um, our third story at this oh, time, time um, our, our third story is about uh, the end of Ebola um, from SEM News. Mm -hmm. Um, Ebola for the past, I think it's uh, 30 days. Uh, there, there have not been Since a the weekend, yeah, been, yeah. yeah. There has not been a single case yeah. that has been reported. The main three countries were um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Um, in total, I think it was 11,000 people died. Uh, 28,000 um, were infected. Now, this is a brilliant thing for um, Africa and mm -hmm. the world for the sure reason that um, Ebola was something very difficult and people found it very hard to challenge. Mm. And do you think these celebrations have perhaps come too soon? Um, or I would it, say, every victory is great. I would say celebrations are in order for the sheer reason that you and I both were well aware about how difficult and how serious it was when Ebola first hit and mm -hmm. the people who lost their lives. Mm -hmm. um, the, w, um, so the, the World Health Organization and numerous NGOs are actually on ground to prevent you know, it from coming again and to make sure that all cases are reported. Mm -hmm. And is this article is suggesting that mm -hmm. there's a lot more to do? So um, what, what else is there to do to, the, to, to, to get rid of a, the, Ebola? Um, the article does say um, it, it ends with, but the challenges still remain. The challenges revolve around um, actually reaching those who need the help. One of the main issues with Ebola and why it spread that, that fast is because many people were not aware of the symptoms okay. and were scared to report it. Mm -hmm. um, the article details a French doctor um, who had a maid who was from Sierra Leone um, and she became sick. The maid lied to him that um, she didn't touch anybody or wasn't, or wasn't around anybody who, who was ill. Um, shortly after the French doctor died, mm -hmm. but he mentioned that I would still, um, I wouldn't be sick if people would discuss it. So it's giving more of a humane picture, uh, human uh, stories. Ex exactly. Uh, the, main, the main issue is to be aware, to, to discuss it and to report it if it's there, not, not to keep quiet. So I think that the, the medical aspect of things are being taken care of by the various um, governments and NGOs and you know people people are on the ground. Oh, so, great. so hopefully it won't return. So the international community mm. is doing its bit. Um, I think not, the international community are reinforcing the medical structures of these countries who have been bedeviled by it. So um, hopefully, um, with a coordinated effort, things should, like you know, um, maintain. Move on. Yeah. yeah hopefully. Yeah. Mm. So what's our fourth article again? Um, uh, the fourth article is uh, why the black poppy really matters. Now the black poppy is. Poppy, yeah, I know. To, to I what, know. Tell our views. What's um, the black poppy? The Remembrance Day um, obviously happens um, between the 9th and the 11th of October each year in Britain, in which people um, commiserate and remember the dead of uh, World War One and World War Two. So that was this week. Though. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, um, um, that was this week. Um, the uh, British Foreign Legion normally sell the red poppy, which everyone wears for yes. like a week um, and, and the two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, a lady, um, Selina Carley from Lon from London. Yeah. Um, created the black poppy. Um, she did that to commemorate the um, the soldiers from Africa, from the Caribbean, who are not entirely mentioned during Remembrance Day. And, mm. and why aren't they? Are they mentioned? Well, Selena, we're going to have later on in the show, so she oh. can give us more of a spiel. Mm, but from brilliant. your perspective, mm, mm. why is it that the the black soldiers' narrative mm. of, within World War One is not told enough? From my perspective. I mean, I think that there is a certain element of bias towards who fought the war. I think everyone should be remembered. But because Britain played a forefront part in it, um, I think they think to themselves that, OK, maybe we should trump up our own benefit rather than others. But everyone knows that um, Indians fought, Pakistanis fought, Nigerians fought, Ghanaians yeah. fought. And at the same time, I think they should all equally be remembered. But because Britain were at the forefront of it and, you know, um, um, the victors always take all the glory, so, you know. But the black poppy, I think, even though mildly controversial, I must admit, and is bound to cause some tension because you know how people get over such issues, but at the same time, I think it's a good stand on, like, a right issue. 
And in, t in terms of people, wh mm. what would you say in the, the diaspora within within Britain? Because mm. this is back poppy c c campaign. Is, of course, yes. Yeah. British um, and the, focus. And, and the money will go to the um, West Indian Association of Service Personnel. Mm. So, mm. so what what are the what do you think as someone from the diaspora? Mm -hmm. Um, I've been from, the, I'm a, I'm a, from, from the, the diaspora. I've always been fascinated with um, that story. Um, I read a book by Barnaby Phillips, um, Another Man's War, in which he details the West African Rifle Battalion um, that fought um, for two years in Burma, um, who put their lives on, on the line for the British Empire. Now, these are stories that don't really get told, stories that are not really mentioned. These are, these are something that, you know, um, has somehow slipped out of consciousness. And that mm. need to be told? Of course need to be told. To keep the narrative within history? Um, to, to keep the truth within history. Thank you, Lagoon, for your comments. Thank you for having me. We're taking a short break now, but when we come back, we'll be delving into how the Commonwealth, and specifically Africa, played a pivotal role in World War I as part of Remembrance Week. See you in a moment.